The views and opinions expressed on Reasonably Speaking are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the American Law Institute or the speakers' organizations. The content presented in this broadcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. Please be advised that episodes of Reasonably Speaking explore complex and often sensitive legal topics and may contain mature content. Welcome to Reasonably Speaking. On this episode, Judge Paul Friedman of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia sits down with Judge Robert Wilkins of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit to talk about his book, Long Road to Hard Truth, The 100-Year Mission to Create the National Museum of African American History and Culture. As his book title indicates, attempts and failures to build a museum dedicated to African-American history date back more than 100 years. Judge Wilkins played an integral role in making the museum a reality. I will now turn over the microphone to Judge Friedman, who will lead the discussion. So, Robert, uh, welcome to this podcast. Uh, The American Law Institute appreciates your doing this. Uh, We're going to talk about your book, which I've read, of course and about the uh, museum. Uh, The book is entitled Long Road to Hard Truth, the 100-year mission to create the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Why did it take 100 years to get there? Well, thanks, Paul, for for this opportunity to to do the podcast. Um, And you ask a very good question. I think that um, when I have thought about why it took 100 years, I think there are really kind of two main um, reasons. One is that the people advocating for this museum um, were primarily you know, African Americans, and they didn't really have much political power, you know, much collective wealth, et cetera. And you need you know, that sort of power and heft to get something like this done. But the other thing that you had was that there were a lot of other, you know, in 1916 when this began, there were a lot of a lot of, you know, priorities within the African American community. And so there were a lot of people who thought, well, you know, creating a, a you know, a museum or they called it a national memorial building, the Negro Achievement back then, that's that would be a nice thing to do, but you know, we've got a lot of people who are being lynched. You know, we have uh, Jim Crow laws that uh, we need to fight against. Uh, We'd really like to have voting rights. And so there were many in the community who who were supportive of the project, but they thought that there were these other things that were perhaps higher priority. And so as a result, um, you know, this, this project over the years didn't always get top priority, and, and as a result, it, it took a long time. Well, when you say within the community, you're talking, I guess, about the African-American community, but there really should be a plural, shouldn't it? There were groups in the South, there were groups in the North where there were some people that were pushing this and others that were pushing back and saying, no, we really have to focus on something else. Well, the flip side, of course, is that um, um, you, the answer to your question is yes, and the flip side is that in the majority community, the, the white community, there were many who were overtly against this and who thought that this uh, was a fool's errand in the sense that they believed and they, you know, there are members of Congress who said this on the, on the floor of the House and the Senate, that there was no such thing as Negro achievement. So. Why should there be some sort of a memorial building to Negro achievement or contributions to America? So there was that sort of overt racism and white supremacy that, um, that the proponents were up against. And then, you know, um, even those who may not have had those sorts of overtly racist feelings might have thought, that, again, um, that, you know, this wasn't something that should be that high of a priority. And so, you know, that was a big part of of why this took so long. Did did things change after the Second World War, after uh, there were a lot of African Americans in the service, after Truman integrated uh, the the services, uh, or did they still remain pretty quiet until a renewed effort until the civil rights era of the 60s? So, you know, after the, the, 
Second World War, um, I think that there was really the focus was on, you know, equality. You know, I think the African American community and the soldiers who had fought in the war felt as if, look, you know, we we fought for for freedom overseas. How about freedom back here? And how about eliminating um, segregation and opening up opportunities here? And so. Similarly, there were, I think there wasn't really um, a renewed interest in the in creating some sort of a national museum until you got to the '60s and and you got to really the Black Studies and Black Power and Black is Beautiful and in all of those like aspects of the Civil Rights Movement that really arose in the '60s and you had you know, um, protests on college campuses, you know, asking for schools, demanding that schools create black history programs or black studies programs. And so it's that same sentiment that really led to this renewed effort to create some sort of a national museum or institute to promote the study of African-American history and culture. But in, in, in addition to what was going on in the streets and on the campuses, you had Lyndon Johnson, may, uh, after Kennedy's assassination, getting Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. Was there a more sympathetic audience in the Congress as well as on the streets and on the campuses in the 60s? Um, the, the, yes, it, it was more sympathetic in Congress, but you still had you know, um, members of Congress who were segregationists and who were anti-civil rights and and they tended to be uh, not supporters of trying to create a national museum. So you still had that in the 60s, um, even though um, it might not have been um, as much of an opposition as you had in the 1910s and, and 1920s. Um, you also had this dynamic of you know, unrest and rioting. You know, there was a major hearing in March of 1968 um, about whether to create a museum or some sort of an institute uh, for African American history. And this hearing was uh, about a month after the Kerner Commission report had come out. And why why didn't something more happen? As you said, it, you mentioned just now, it was after the Kerner Commission basically said, we've got two societies, one black and one white. You said this is in March of 68. The next month, Martin Luther King's assassinated. Why wasn't there some sort of a groundswell given all of those events? It's a great question, Paul. Um, and, you know, I don't really know that I have a great answer to the question other than that the same sort of uh, you know benign neglect um, that has afflicted this country you know for decades, if not centuries, with respect to um, these sorts of issues, you know, continued um, despite all of that. You know, the irony uh, you point out um, King's assassination, you know, just shortly after this, is that one of the things that happened during that hearing is that James Baldwin said you know, we need to establish some sort of a museum or institute, and we need to study why all of my heroes seem to end up dead. Um, and then, ironically, 17 days later, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King is assassinated. Um, and there's no museum gets passed. Um, you know, there were efforts to try to get it off the ground, um, um, but, but they didn't go anywhere. In, in part because um, uh, you didn't really have a prominent um, sponsor within the federal government or within the Smithsonian to do this. The Smithsonian was not interested in creating this museum in the 60s. I guess we fast forward from the 60s to the 80s because uh, there's a chapter in your book that's entitled, Enter John Lewis and the Smithsonian. And um, one wonders why with such an iconic figure as John Lewis involved, um, there wasn't greater success in that decade. So 
Yes, in the 80s, John Lewis gets involved, and he actually picks up the mantle from uh, Congressman Mickey Leland. Oh, yeah. Mickey Leland um, was working with a gentleman named Tom Mack, who owned the Tourmobile Company. Um, I don't even know if they have the Tourmobiles anymore, but they used to be you know, ubiquitous with tourism in Washington. The, Red, white, and blue you know, buses that went around. So he, so he saw an economic reason to want to have this kind of. You could say that it was part of his self-interest, but he was a, you know, African American businessman. He'd started this, this great business, which was, you know, to take people around the mall in Washington, and he felt like, you know, where's the African American representation in all of these places where, you know, my business is taking people. And he felt very strongly that there should be a museum. And he worked with Mickey Leland to try to get Congress to... It was an African-American congressman. Yes, yes, from Texas. And Mickey Leland tragically was killed in a plane crash. And, um, and so John Lewis had come into Congress by that time, and he kind of took up where Mickey Leland left off in being the champion uh, of this. And so... Um, you know, they had some interest in in Congress, and they got a non-binding resolution passed. I in think the it, House, uh, or in, in both. I think it passed both the House and Senate, but it was just a non-binding resolution. You know, saying we support this, but the Smithsonian still wasn't really on board. And so, what happened is that um, there was a lot of criticism of the Smithsonian for uh, being insensitive to um, African Americans in their exhibits, um, not having enough African Americans and other minorities and women within their staff and leadership, et cetera. And the pressure built on the Smithsonian, and the Smithsonian decided to appoint a blue ribbon commission to study whether they should um, create an, a separate African American museum. This was around the same time that, that John Lewis was making his efforts. Yes, yeah, so, so John Lewis's efforts helped um, you know, spur the, the Smithsonian to do some soul searching, essentially, and they appointed this commission, and the commission uh, recommended that the Smithsonian create such a museum and sent that recommendation to the Board of Regents and the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian, its governing body, said, okay, we agree, let's, let's get behind creating a museum. So right around 1990 or so, uh, for the first time, the Smithsonian itself is on board with doing this. And, and so John Lewis and, and the rest of the advocates in Congress get really close. In 1992, they get a bill passed through the Senate um, Senator, Senator Paul Simon was kind of the leader on the Senate From side. And, uh, but they couldn't get the bill passed in the House. And ironically, it was an African-American member of the House named Gus Savage who blocked the bill. And why was he opposed to it? Because he felt that it should be specified in the legislation that the museum would get a new building on the National Mall. The American Indian Museum was going to be in a new building on the mall. The Holocaust Museum was going to be in a new building just off of the mall, but very adjacent to the mall. And he felt that the African American Museum should itself get a new building on the mall. And uh, the compromise legislation was to start out with the museum in an existing building, the building next to the Smithsonian Castle. It's called the Arts and Industries Building. Right. And then over time, raise money and figure out um, a, a space for uh, a newer, larger building. So Congressman Lewis, you know, mm -hmm. I think he would have preferred, of course, to have a new building on the mall, but, you know, he, he didn't have the votes to get that through, so he thought that this would be a good first step. Gus Savage was the chair of the relevant committee, and so he could bottle it up in his committee and prevent it from getting to a vote of the full house. 
and so um, it passes the Senate and it can't pass the House. The next um, session of Congress in 1994, Gus Savage is no longer in Congress. He had been um, voted out. So it passes the House. Um, but Jesse Helms, who I think had been in the hospital and away from the Senate, when they took the vote in 1992, he's Jesse back. Helms from North Carolina. He's back, yes. And Senator Helms blocks it in the Senate. Um, and so, you know, it passes the House and not the Senate this time. It had passed the Senate and not the House the prior time. And, um, you know, the people who had been fighting for this, you know, from the mid-'80s up until that point really kind of grew uh, frustrated, tired, et cetera. They'd been at it about a decade. And the composition of the House changed after the 94 elections. Right, the Newt Gingrich year when the House yes. turned very Republican. And the um, and, uh, political sentiment at that point was that, you know, you know, John Lewis didn't think that he'd be able to get it through the House anymore. I mean, he kept introducing the legislation but it never wasn't getting any traction then at that point. So now we get to you. Um, you've written th th this part of the history pretty much in the first half of your book. Now we get to the chapter uh, where you enter the story in 1996 and you proclaim yourself a foolhardy soul for getting involved. So <laughs> why and what did you do? So uh, yes, it was a foolhardy, um, I think, exploit, you know, I think there were a lot of things going on in my life there in the mid 90s that caused me to, to, I think, gravitate toward this project. I was a public defender here in Washington with the DC Public Defender Service. And that was, um, you know, while I loved the job, it was a really grueling experience and, and oftentimes just mentally taxing and just depressing experience. You know, I, a lot of my clients. I mean, by definition, they were all poor, but so many of them, you know, had, you know, they'd grown up with, you know, mental, emotional, physical, sexual abuse. They affected by drug abuse within their families, et cetera. You know, um, they were just caught in this cycle, and I just kind of felt like at times I was on on a treadmill. So it's just really. Uh, you know, mentally exhausting kind of a job. And, and, and knowing the caseloads that they still carry in the federal public defender and the P public defender serves the District of Columbia, it's also physically exhausting because you get you probably have more clients than you can handle and you've, you've got a lot of pressures from people like you and me, in other words, judges. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We had a lot of pressures uh, on all sides. And so, um, you know, I, uh, there were many, many a nights where, you know, I was at the D.C. jail still at midnight, you know, trying to talk to my client and, you know, about what was going to happen in court or, you know, prepare him for, for trial or, or to, to enter a plea of guilty or, or to get ready for a sentencing or whatever it was. So, you know, I was, I was kind of physically and mentally um, tired. And so I, I just felt like at that point in my life that, um, you know, I was beating my head against the wall, you know, with my clients. And I wanted to be a part of creating something, building something, um, being part of an institution that would um, maybe help people understand, you know, this history that we have in, in our country of discrimination and maybe learn from it and you know, help some of my clients or their children understand that people fought and died for them to have you know, opportunities to go to school and to vote and participate in civil society and you know, take advantage of those opportunities. And, and for people like those police officers to see you know, this history and legacy of discrimination and the, and the harm and injury that it's caused and maybe you know, um, be more enlightened and turn from those ways. So, you know, I really became obsessed with, with wanting to create the museum because I think I felt like I was failing, you know, 
um, in, in everything else that I was doing, if, you know, if I'm to be honest about it. And so, how did you, how did you begin to, to, to get involved or to resurrect the efforts that had failed in the past? So the catalyst was an unfortunate death. Um, there was a gentleman from um, our church who passed away. Um, um, you know, he collapsed on the dance floor uh, dancing with his wife at his 60th birthday, um, a man named Louis Fraction. And he, he died in that sudden and tragic fashion. And so my wife and I went to you know, visit with and, and, and pay our respects at the home. And there were lots of people gathered there. Um, you, know, um, you know, people, friends from church or work or neighbors, et cetera. And there were people just sharing all these stories, memories, memories of him or people were just, you know, shooting the breeze generally about growing up. And, you know, I heard people talk about, you know, going to segregated, you know, one room schools and and participating in sit-ins and 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 just all of these stories and as we were driving home that night I said to my wife I said why don't we have a museum that captures all of that and I started poking around on the internet and I saw that John Lewis was working on this and I went to see him in his office and his staff and 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 you know said you know how can I help and started uh, trying to figure out how to work with them and I started a nonprofit to kind of be an outside arm to to assist with those efforts and um, in you know for the reasons I mentioned before and this was like a good outlet for me I felt like you know this was something that I could work on outside of you know my job as a public defender outside of you know, being a plaintiff and kind of co-counsel in this racial profiling lawsuit that maybe could lead to lead to something, you know, positive to leads to building something. But at some point you decided to work virtually full time on this, as I recall, and leave your job and work out of your basement with nobody paying you a dime to do so. That's a pretty big step. So yeah, there's a thin line between faith and foolishness, and I was Firmly straddling that line, I think. Um, and I'm sure Amina, your wife, was delighted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's a saint, and she, but she believed in the, you know, the cause of the museum as much as I did. And so, you know, when I went to her in August of 2000 and said, you know, I really think I want to devote my full time to this effort and quit my job and work on this. Um, you know, she was seven months pregnant with our second child, and you know it wasn't a good time to go from two incomes to one um, at all. But you know, she said, "Yes, we'll do it." You know, we had always been careful to live below beneath our means, and we had some money saved up, and we agreed that we would change our daycare arrangements and some other things, and do this, and um, give it a year and see see where where we could go. Now, I wasn't completely crazy, Paul, because I, I had applied for a grant uh, from the D.C. government. It's like a community development type grant because one of the things that we were exploring was whether we could build the museum um, off of the mall at a place called Poplar Point. Oh, yeah. And um, in and so have this museum kind of be part of a community development project. And there were grant funding for that. And so I had a letter agreement um, from, for a letter o a award from the DC government for a $150,000 grant. Um, the problem is that the DC government never made good <laughs> on, <laughs> on that. So we never got a dime of that. So I quit thinking that you know, um, we get that money, and that some of that money could go to administrative expenses and and help offset expenses and pay me a little bit of a salary. That didn't happen. But it didn't happen. So what? So what did you do? How did how did you get the ball rolling? And how did you involve other people in in the effort? So um, I 
you know, I and others started, you know, meeting with, you know, the historically black uh, uh, fraternities and sororities and groups like the NAACP and the Urban League and, and um, other civil rights types organizations and got them to, you know, write letters of support and kind of get on board. And who were they writing to? Uh, members of Congress and um, and you know so I was doing those sorts of things um, and you know Congressman Lewis and others were continuing to to meet with with their colleagues in, in Congress to see if they could kind of get um, more support for this and around um, Sometime around mid to late 2000, um, Senator Sam Brownback went to pay the visit to John Lewis uh, because he had a, a vision of creating some sort of a national museum dedicated to slavery. You know, he felt that very strongly that. It was, you know, America's original sin, and we needed to really document it and come to grips with it. It was like, you know, a boil that needed to be lanced uh, in order to heal. And where did he get that motivation from? If you if you ever learned that, so he he said that, you know, he used to jog along the mall and just think about, you know, things and as a release in that there were a couple of things that really struck him. One was that one of the committees that he was on um, was very involved with uh, human trafficking. And so, you know, modern day slavery. Right. And, and he just felt like he couldn't believe that some of the things were still going on given, you know, were the lessons we should have learned from the transatlantic slave trade and elsewhere. And then I think he also was like very moved by the Holocaust Museum, which had opened in 1992, I believe it was. And that, you know, it, 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 it made sure, at least helped, was, you know, hoping to make sure that people never forget. And he's like, you know, are we forgetting slavery here? Um, and so he felt that there really needed to be a museum um, to, to tell that story. And so he went to see Congressman Lewis because he hadn't been in the House or the Senate in 92 or 94. Uh, he came in 96, I think, to Congress. And so, so he found out that Congressman Lewis was the leader of the efforts for an African-American museum, and so he went to see him, and they bonded over this issue. Um, so you've got this white Republican from the Midwest and this civil rights African-American icon from the South really bonding over this, this yeah. issue. Yeah, his, um, his staffer who was there, um, she told me that, that Congressman Lewis pulled down a, a book from um, his shelf and his, his office is like a museum. It's got all these books and awards and photos and things. But it was a book of lynching photographs. And Congressman Lewis had, I think, written a foreword to the book. And he you know, said, you know, Sam, let me show you this, this book. And they were paging through. And they stopped at a photograph of, and I think it had been turned into a postcard but it was a photograph that showed a, a young white boy, maybe like eight or 10 years old, with this ear-to-ear -ear grin. And in the background is a black man hanging from a tree. And, you know, this huge crowd. And this kid, you know, just thought that this was like the best thing since sliced bread. You could just see it on his face in that photograph. And they, and they, and they lingered on that photograph. And, and, um, and, you know, at that moment, I think they were, you know, seared of the same mind that that mentality um, needed to be, you know, dealt with 
in a serious fashion in a museum or the mall. And, and, and where did you go from there? You've now got Congressman Lewis and Senator Brown back over here on the Hill. You've got you in your basement, and you've got the goal of having the Smithsonian be the, be the home of the vision that, that you had. What happened next? So another um, miraculous thing um, happened, which was that, um, you know, I stumbled upon the fact that the effort to create this museum actually went back to 1916. You know, up until that point, I thought, and everybody else on the Hill thought, that the effort began in the 60s. And of course, that was a long time. That meant that it was, had been going on for about 30 years and surely needed to happen by now. But then when we learned that it actually went back to 1916, so that the, the effort was really 80 years old, 80 plus years old, and we learned um, and I learned that Congress had passed a bill to create um, a national muse memorial building to Negro achievement in 1929. They didn't fund it, and because of the Depression, um, you know, there was no way to raise the money privately to build it, and so it never happened. But, you know, I actually learned that Congress had approved this very museum, essentially, um, 70 years prior. Uh, no funding, and it never happened. And that, that helped to change the dynamic. It helped to change the conversation because, you know, the argument became, you know, um, really, um, why do we have to wait? Why do we have to keep, you know, going back over and over again? And, you know, essentially, you know, this has been approved. Um, uh, let's just make this thing happen. And um, President Bush came into office in early 2001, and the Senator Brownback and Congressman J.C. Watts, a Republican, black Republican from Oklahoma, who was among the, the House Republican leadership, they spoke to President Bush about this project, that they wanted to make it happen, and he agreed that uh, it was a good idea and that he supported it. And so um, he even had uh, Vice President Cheney uh, deliver that message to the Republican senators in his capacity as president of the Senate and, you know, so he sat them down and said, President Bush wants this to happen, make it happen. And so this is at the beginning of his term. And, um, and so all of a sudden now, you've got this bipartisan coalition. Very bipartisan. In support of this museum. It's interesting that you say that he, he asked the vice president to go tell the, the Senate Republicans because I'm sure there are lots of people that have meetings with a, any president of the United States who says, sure, that's a good idea, I'm all for it, and then nothing ever happens. But, yeah. But Bush was really genuinely behind it. Yes, indeed, indeed. And, um, and that made a difference. And so by May of 2001, uh, they had drafted legislation and they had, you know, um, over 100 original co-sponsors that included you know, pretty much all of the leadership, House and Senate, um, both sides, um, in support of, of creating this new National Museum of African American History and Culture within the Smithsonian. And they had this press conference to uh, announce this, and, 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 and J.C. Watts uh, joked that, like, you'll never see this cast of characters, you know, all together at a press conference supporting something maybe ever again. But, but, but you, you see it here because you had him, you had Congressman John Lewis, you had Senator Brownback, you had Senator Max Cleland, you had then Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton, you had then Senator um, Rick Santorum, you had um, then Senator John Edwards, um, among others, all there saying, you know, we support this bill, we want it to pass. And it looked like it was just gonna sail through Congress, like, you know, hot knife through butter. Um, and? 
And, um, you know, four, four months later, September 11th, attacks happened. And People's minds were focused on other things. Exactly. I mean, you know, Congress, understandably, was focused on war, intelligence failures. Do we, you know, establish a new Department of Homeland Security, USA Patriot Act, all of those things. And uh, the economy was taking a downturn. And so um, um, the support for the museum was there, but, 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 but the sentiment was is that, you know, we've got bigger fish to fry here. And, you know, there are some concerns about whether, you know, this is completely feasible. So why don't we put uh, this on the pause uh, button right now? And so how did that affect your life personally? I understand, and you understand why, why the leadership in the White House and on the Hill had to focus on other things. But you were still working for free in your basement, two young boys in the household, um, and facing the prospect that nothing was going to happen for a while. I mean, it was devastating because was devastating because the attacks themselves were devastating, but, you know, I had given up everything <laughs> and thought that, you know, we were going to get this through. And then now there was this, this um, complete, um, I wouldn't say shutdown, but, but, but it just didn't seem that there was any path to get this through Congress. But you know, I didn't want to give up. Congressman Lewis didn't want to give up, and neither did Senator Brownback and the others. And so they had, um, they put their heads together and they said, well, what can we do um, to kind of keep this moving along? And the proposal that arose from that was to create a, a presidential commission to write a plan of action for how to move forward. And I insisted that it be called um, a plan of action commission because, um, you know, I had researched and there had been about four or five prior commissions that studied, um, you so know, you didn't what, want, what to you do. You didn't just want to study I didn't anymore. want to study anymore. And I knew, you know, I wasn't a complete, um, you know, I hadn't fallen off the turnip truck, you know, um, that day, and I knew what happened with uh, commissions. Typically, you know, Congress or the president creates a commission as a way to kind of kick the can down the road. The commission, you know, studies it, writes a report, and sometimes it leads to action, but most of the time those reports just kind of gather dust. You know, I was very afraid of that happening. So um, they created the framework where this commission would have a one-year tenure to work and write an action plan for how to move forward with recommended legislation and then there was kind of a handshake agreement among the leadership that if the commission came up with a feasible plan to move forward that they would support it and and try to fund it and um and you know there was um I wasn't at at that meeting, but but um, one of the staffers who was you know sitting outside the room when all the principals were 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 meeting you know talked about looking through through the the window of the door and seeing you know at the end of the meeting Senator Robert Byrd you know embracing um, John Lewis after they had reached this agreement. And Byrd was important because he chaired the Appropriations Committee. And given his history, very symbolic. Yes, you know, so you had this man who was a former member of the Ku Klux Klan, you know, um, um, uh, embracing um, the civil rights leader um, because they had reached this uh, agreement in principle about how to try to move forward with an African-American history museum. And so you became the Chairman of the commission? I became the chair of the site and building committee of the commission. A gentleman named Bob Wright was the chair of the, the, 
the commission. And, and how did the members, I mean, how did Bob Wright become chair? Who was Bob Wright? How did other, who were the other people involved? So um, the legislation said that, um, that members of Congress um, on both sides and the president could, you know, um, appoint people to the commission. And, um, and so I was recommended by Congressman Lewis to be on the commission. I'm not sure who recommended um, Bob Wright to be on the commission. Um, there were, people were fa fairly diverse because there were some big name people like the actress Cicely Tyson and Hank Aaron was on the commission. Um, Bob Wright was a, is a businessman and, um, and there were some other people with backgrounds in business, but there were other people with backgrounds in history or museums. Um, in any rate, um, we, we got together and at our first meeting, we, we elected um, um, Wright as our chair and Claudine Brown as, as the vice chair. And she had been the person who had um, chaired the committee that the Smithsonian put together at the end of the 1980s. To, to figure out um, whether it should support a museum. And, and was, the com was the Smithsonian on board with the commission and the idea of moving forward and doing something within the Smithsonian uh, umbrella or under the Smithsonian umbrella? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there were certainly people within the Smithsonian who were very supportive, but um, there were elements of the Smithsonian leadership that um, they wanted to see a museum happen, but they didn't think that it should be a part of the Smithsonian. I mean, the, the so that they, was an ongoing debate. Yes, yes. They they felt that the Smithsonian, you know, they needed to raise a lot of money to fix their existing museums, and Congress wasn't giving them enough money. They felt to kind of you know sustain their operations, so they they didn't want to agree to take on what they saw it would be a new burden. And they said that to Congressman Lewis and others. Um, you know, then 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 um, head of the Smithsonian, Larry Small, said that to them. And um, and Congressman Lewis and the others' response was, "Well, that may be your opinion, but we're Congress, and we think you should do it." And so they were pressing ahead, but that was that was one of the issues that was up in the air at that time was would would we be a part of the Smithsonian? And in, in when you were the chair of the site committee, yes. so were you were you uh, focused on the issue of the Smithsonian, or were you focused on getting it on the mall or near the mall? What what did you view as your mission? Well, that committee are, was to try to figure out the best site for the museum, and so you know that was the key question: on the mall or or off the mall somewhere, hopefully near the mall. And so we evaluated all the various sites, and we ultimately uh, concluded and recommended to the commission that we should um, um, seek a site on the mall. And we had two that we thought were appropriate and um, for for new construction. One is just we were committed at this point to a new building, not yes. the old idea of putting it in some existing yes. structure. Yes. So one of the sites was kind of corner to this very courthouse where we're sitting right there at 3rd and Constitution um, um, there, but on the south side of the Constitution. So that's technically part of the U.S. Capitol grounds. Right. And then the other site is where the museum ended up getting built at 14th and Constitution. But we thought that both of those sites could accommodate a structure that the original plans for the mall done by Pierre L'Enfant and Benjamin Banneker um, uh, anticipated monumental buildings at each of those locations. So, being the originalist that I am, Paul, I you know uh, prevailed upon um, the committee members in Congress to be true to the original intent of the plan for the National Mall and put the museum on the mall. I'm glad you're an originalist. Yes, I just wanted to clear that up. Paul. Yes. It's, it's a great location. It really is. And when you drive by, it's uh, an iconic, I think, piece of architecture on the outside. And I know you went through a lot, and I don't know whether this was the commission or subsequent to the commission in choosing the architect, but uh, it's really quite a, quite a building. 
Yeah, I, it is a wonderful building. I can't take any credit for any of that because um, once um, the decision was finally made to, to locate the museum on the mall, my official role ended and the Smithsonian took over. And to their credit, Larry Small, the head of the Smithsonian and the rest of the Smithsonian leadership, you know, got on board and did a phenomenal job of making sure that this museum would happen. They hired a fantastic director, Nani Bunch. They assembled a great fundraising committee. They did an international um, design search to, for the architects and, um, and selected, you know, a wonderful design. And it's, uh, um, you know, a group of architects of African descent. So this is the first building on the mall designed by ar architects of African descent. It's also the first um, LEED uh, gold certified building on the mall. So it's, it's very environmentally um, friendly. And it's an engineering marvel and an architectural marvel. And it's, it's just phenomenal. Was the site decision and the fact that the Smithsonian would be, that it would be under the Smithsonian's umbrella, was that all encapsulated in the legislation that Congress passed? So the legislation was interesting because Congress agreed on everything except the site. And so they decided to pass the legislation without saying where the museum would be. They said, you're going to have a museum, Smithsonian, you're going to create the museum, we're going to give you the money to do it. Um, you have to raise you know, half of the construction funds privately, we'll give you the other half. Um, we can't decide where it should be, so we're going to delegate to the Smithsonian Board of Regents the final decision of where the museum uh, will be located. And they said you can pick from, from um, uh, four spots. Um, the spot there at 14th and Constitution, you could locate it in that Arts and Industries building if you want on the mall and try to convert it and make that work. And then there were two locations just off of the mall. They said you could uh, pick um, one of those. And, and Chief Justice Roberts um, uh, tells a story of how... For those who, who don't know, uh, this is kind of a, a, an interesting little footnote to the way Washington runs. The Chief Justice of the United States is the chairman of the board of the Smithsonian by tradition, as I yeah, understand. Chancellor. It. Chancellor of the Smithsonian Board of Regents. And so he had been nominated, as you recall, to be an associate justice yes. originally, and then Chief Justice Rehnquist dies. And so President Bush um, then nominates him to be Chief Justice. And so um, he, he told, told this story to me and others about how you know, he went to the White House for kind of like an orientation session or, you know, of, of like, well, this is how your, your role would change of being chief justice and, as opposed to just an associate justice. And one of your obligations is to be chancellor of the Smithsonian. And he said, you know, they said, you know, yeah, they meet maybe once a quarter and, you know, there are important things, but it's usually nothing like really controversial or anything that you, that you have to decide. And then, you know, he gets confirmed. And then his very first meeting uh, as chancellor of the Smithsonian Board of Regents on the agenda is we have to decide where we're going to put the National <laughs> Museum of African American History and Culture. Not a very kind Not of a controversial uh, decision at all to make, right? Um, and I had written, um, I think it was like a 16 page single space letter to Chief Justice Rehnquist about why they should pick the site on the mall, you know, for new construction. And, you know, that letter, of course, would have gotten passed on to, to him. Um, and so, um, so I thanked him for granting my motion when, when I saw him. <laughs> it's probably a much harder motion to get the chief to grant than when you go up there and move somebody's admission to the membership in the Supreme Court. Those he grants routinely, but this was, uh, this was uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, difficult. Um, I think we probably should wrap up pretty quickly, but I, I just wanted to make the point that as you discuss this and what you, I believe you said this in, in your book, 
uh, you've said on other occasions, I know, that your dream was to be a catalyst to make this project happen. But Lonnie Bunch, the director of the museum, has called you on a number of occasions, the conscience of the group. And uh, reading the book, uh, your devotion has been remarkable and what you've accomplished, admittedly with lots of other people involved too, but the leadership you've shown is, is, uh, is something that we now have a tangible, uh, no matter what you do as a judge, Robert, we have a tangible, important, historical uh, museum that captures the history. And for those who haven't been there, uh, maybe just spend a minute or two before we conclude, uh, explaining what you see when you go in that museum. I know the first time I went there, I must have spent two and a half hours. You can barely scratch the surface in two and a half hours. You, you, it covers so much ground. Of, African-American history and culture. And you can't forget the culture part of it either uh, when you get to those top floors. So maybe we should r wrap up with you talking a little bit about the museum itself today. Yeah, I mean, you know, what uh, Lonnie Bunch and his staff did is really phenomenal. Um, and I can't say enough about him and, and all of the staff there. But what they did was they created really um, two parts of the museum, uh, the history galleries that are under underground. And so you begin your journey of the museum by taking an elevator or stairs down six stories, you know, where you begin around 1400, and the museum introduces you to Africa and Europe uh, and the New World as they existed then, and uh, political and economic structures as they exist in to help you understand how the transatlantic slave trade comes to be. And that's very much um, motivated by the e economics of the time. And in, you know, having set that context, then it really um, then dives in um, with, with some detail and you know, the slave trade and the founding of the Americas and the establishment of slavery and and on through to the Civil War and Civil Rights Movement and kind of ends with the uh, election of uh, President Obama. Um, with lots in between, obviously. And then um, the upper floors, um, you know, cover art um, both, you know, performance art and and um, visual arts and and iconic sports and, figures and sports figures and community and the way that African Americans, you know, um, you know, formed various aspects of civil society to support each other and to, you know, fight for equality and participate in the military and. And all of these other kind of aspects of, of culture and also history, and so um, so it's really just uh, amazing. Uh, music uh, can't forget m the music galleries, uh, which are really my favorite, and uh, so so it's just so such a wealth of information. Um, you, you know, you really, you know, if you're somebody who, who likes to read everything and look at all the videos and everything, you could spend a week there. Uh, you, you haven't even mentioned the whole civil rights struggle on some of the middle floors. And, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I think that they did a phenomenal job. Well, so I hope everybody will go visit it. I know the lines are long and you have to get tickets in advance. Um, at least some days and some hours of the days, but uh, it's it's well worth it. It's definitely worth it, and um, and don't let the issue of tickets dissuade you. You know they they want people to see the museum, and pretty much everybody I know who's told me that they've gone and and just been patient and asked to you know be let in. You know um, they they found the way to let them in. Yeah. Well, thank you very much on, on behalf of the American Law Institute for participating in this discussion. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been fascinating, and I hope that the people that listen to this uh, have learned a lot, as I have, and will and we'll go visit the museum next time they're in Washington, D.C. Thanks, Paul. It was a pleasure to do it.
Thank you for tuning in to Reasonably Speaking. Visit ALI.org to learn more about this important topic and our speakers. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Reasonably Speaking is produced by the American Law Institute with audio engineering by Kathleen Morton and digital editing by Kristen Evans. Podcast episodes are moderated by Jennifer Marinigo, and I'm Sean Kellum.